Thank you, Pastor Nalene. So this morning, a couple things also to share with you before we jump into the message. Tonight at 6 o'clock is our annual business meeting. If you are here and you are an official member of the church, you literally signed a piece of paper saying you'd be there. So you have to come. You have to. If you don't, I will send Pastor David to your house. And you know you don't want that. So we encourage us. Six o'clock tonight here. If you are not a member, but this is your church, I also want to encourage you to come out. We're covering some important things that that you want to be aware of. So hopefully we will see you again tonight at six o'clock. Also, I saw it today. A couple of our second service families went to first. If, If you are able to do so as second service is continuing to grow, which is wonderful. If you are able to make it to first, we will offer you parking and a seat, even with your family, which is big. It's big here. Uh, So if you are able to, especially with Easter and the Easter season coming up, like it's winter and we're bursting at the seams. So if you can help us, you and your family, by coming to first, we would greatly appreciate that. Good? All right, so I thought I had this, uh, this hour time change thing nicked, like I had, I had a strategy, I was re- ready to go. Went to bed earlier than I want to share, and oh, I'm not proud, but I went to bed early, and it was too early, my body thought it was a nap, <laughs> and I woke up about two and a half hours later, <laughs> I was like, oh, oops, so, but I went back to sleep, so I'm good now, I'm good, I'm ready to go. So did you catch up, did you get enough sleep? You're going to make it through service. If the person next to you starts nodding off, give him, give him a little something. Keep him, keep him in the game today. So last week we began a series. We're going to continue it this week. As we know, as we lead up to Easter, we are coming upon the most important event, not only in Christianity, but I would argue the history of the world. We are talking about Good Friday, ironic name, good for us, not for Jesus, His death on the cross, the crucifixion. So the title of the series is At the Cross, and we're talking about what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross, his sacrifice. And the reason I say this is the most important event is without without Good Friday, without the cross, without Calvary, his birth isn't as important. Without the cross, without Jesus suffering and paying the price for us, well, there is no resurrection without his death. The cross is the central point of our faith as well as the turning point for mankind, coming to God, returning to God. Many churches don't like to talk about the cross or the blood of Jesus or hell, but that is essential for the believer to understand. It's at the cross where Jesus shed his blood to save us from hell. That's a good thing. We need to know that. His amazing sacrifice. And the cross reminds us, and we'll hear it again today, Jesus is the only way to the Father. There's no other way There's no other system in place. It's only through Jesus, only by his blood. Because of this, 1 Corinthians 1.18 talks about the cross like this. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To those who don't get it, to those who say, oh, religion is a crutch and I don't need that, I don't need that. To those who don't understand it, they think the cross is foolishness. But to you and I, to those who are saved, it is the power of God to salvation. I'm thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for what he accomplished there for us. Jesus didn't go to the cross for himself. He didn't die because of his own problems. He died for me. He died for you, and then he took our place. So last week we began, and we were preaching through a couple theological terms. Last week we talked about reconciliation, substitution. My favorite, because I get to spit when I say it, propitiation. Did I get you? Propitiation. And then atonement. This week we have a couple more for you that really highlight even deeper what Jesus accomplishes for the believer 
at the cross. It's a big list. It's a big list. So let's jump into that this morning. And the first one that we want to tackle is, uh, it's a word you've heard before, but you might not understand it in the, in the theological sense, in a church or religious usage. It's the word justification. What is justification? Simply put, to justify is to declare us righteous. We were justified by Christ at the cross. He declared us to be righteous, to be holy, because we're not, right? We're we're not righteous, we're not holy, but at that moment when we put our faith in what Jesus did for us at the cross, we're declared to be righteous. Uh, Another definition says the declaring of or making righteous in the sight of God. There's a clip in the office. Any office fans here? Anybody? Anybody? Come on. I don't want to make a joke for two people. There's two, there's two office fans here. <laughs> Whatever. I'm making it anyway. And in that scene, Michael Scott comes out and goes, I declare bankruptcy. And, and they no, Michael, that's not how it works. I declare righteousness. You, you don't get to declare your own righteousness. What it says here is that when we put our faith in Jesus, he declares us righteous. We are made righteous before the Father. See, each of us has that stain of sin on our life. None of us are excused. We don't blame Adam and Eve because we've done enough ourselves to mess up. And that stain of sin, if not dealt with, keeps us eternally separated from God. But at the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin. And for those who put their faith in him, at the moment you do it, it's not a process. At the moment you declare your faith in Jesus, he declares you righteous. You have a status change, and it takes place in a moment. The Bible tells us about two thieves that are crucified next to Jesus. Familiar with the story. The one on the right starts hurling some insults and saying, come on, Jesus, if you're the son of God, get off the cross and, and take us with you. And the other one shushes the guy. And he, he makes this statement to Jesus. This is not an elaborate prayer. Jesus wasn't like, bow your head and repeat after me, <laughs> right? Like, wasn't the time for it. The man just looked to the guy in the middle, and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned and said to him, today I'll be with you. Today. Not a long process, didn't have to join a church, didn't have to start serving on the nursery team. Just just put his faith in what Jesus was doing for him, and instantly he was declared righteous. This is so significant because this guy was a career criminal. This guy was a crook, he was a thief. He spent his whole life hurting other people, and in his final moments, maybe, maybe hour, hours, at the very end of his rope, he put his faith in the only one with the power to save him. And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Je- he was declared righteous. That's what Jesus does for us. Even though we're sinners, even though we've made mistakes, even though our past is littered with failures and inadequacies, all of us, at the cross, Jesus declares us to be righteous, something only he can do. In our justice system, it's designed so that 10 guilty people will get off before one innocent person is convicted. You need overwhelming evidence to convict someone. Sometimes it is very difficult to convict someone. Many times, there are people who did it. They did it in our system. We know they did it, but there's just not enough evidence to convict. And sometimes we'll we'll hear the judge declare them not guilty. By no means are they innocent. They did it. They just simply couldn't prove it. In God's justice system, it's different. There's no not guilty. Because God knows everything and he sees everything. There's two classes in God's system. There's guilty and there's innocent. 
we're all guilty. Every single one of us. And God has more than enough evidence, more than enough receipts to show us. But at the moment we put our faith in him, he declares us, he doesn't say not guilty, he declares us innocent. He declares us righteous. Why? Because his son took our place. He paid our price so you and I can be declared righteous before God. Justification then is an act where God pronounces a sinner to be righteous because of that sinner's faith. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access. I want you to focus on that word access. Through him also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because of what Jesus did for us, we have access. You guys still have hall passes, high schoolers? It's been a, been a minute since I've been there. Okay, we still have, we still have you, you go in the hallway and you're walking down and the hall monitor, you know, usually some retired guy who's kind of angry is out there. He's like, hey, what are you doing in the hall? And then you're like, no, 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 no. And you pull out your pass. And somewhere you, you're not allowed to be, you're now allowed access because you have, you have a pass. Maybe you, you have a handicap placard, a little something you hook on your mirror or the, the symbol on your plate, and you get to park in the, the blue spots. I always thought it was choice parking. I had no, <laughs> I was like, they left me two spots up front. This is, no, I'm kidding. You, you have the placard. You, you have the, 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 the symbol on your plate. And someone else would be like, well, why can't I park there? No, no, I'm allowed to be there. I have this. It gives you access to a place that otherwise you wouldn't be allowed to go. That's what justification is. At the cross, Jesus gives us access to his grace in a place that otherwise we don't deserve to go. And you know who did all the work? He did. Not you, not me, not by our own works, but by his own grace. He gives us access to him. That's what it means to, to be justified. That's what justification is all about. Second term for you this morning, big one, sanctification. Woo, mm, I feel holy just saying it. Sanctification, the literal definition means to be set apart. To be set apart. When you put your faith in what Jesus did for you at the cross, he immediately sets you apart from the world. Again, not gradual, not something that takes place over time, not something you have to behave better to earn it or join a church. When you put your faith in what Jesus did for you at the cross, you are instantly sanctified. You are set apart by God. Only the power of the cross. Now that, that creates some uncomfortable truths for us today. That means in one moment we're sinners, and then the moment we put our faith in Christ, we're saints. Immediately. Ladies, look at your husband today and tell him, you're a saint. It's the Bible. You got to do it. Immediately. Does that mean we're perfect? Far from it. Now, sanctification has multiple tenses. We have instant sanctification. At the cross, you go from sinner to saint like that. But then we have the next phase of sanctification known as progressive or experiential. And this is the part that we talk a lot about here. We talk about that process of growing, becoming more like Jesus. We're saved immediately. We're not saved because we cleaned ourselves up enough. No way. We're saved because of what Jesus did on the cross, and that's the only reason. But because he did that for us, we're going to live different. Hopefully, as a follower of Christ, you are not the same person you were when Jesus saved you. 
because you've begun to grow in him. You've begun to adopt his character and put yours to bed. Bible talks about crucifying the flesh. When you give your heart to Jesus, he begins to change. He begins to change so, some of the, the focus of your life. He begins to change some of the habits. He begins to change some of the mindsets. You'll find that he begins to change maybe some of your circle. God, yeah, it's like free agency. God might have you cut a few people, sign a few new ones in there to, to complete the group. Because God changes us and things change and, and our, our likes and dislikes and what, what motivates us changes. This is all part of that gradual process of sanctification. I love the passage in 1 Corinthians that Paul talks about this process. It starts in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and it begins very simply by saying, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is a direct response to people who make a claim, a claim. Oh, yeah, 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 I gave my heart to Jesus. But when you look at their life, there is absolutely no indication that they did it. There, there is nothing that you could see that would verify that fact. Now, that could be the case. It was for the thief on the cross. But I have to believe if that thief would have come off that cross and went on to live his life, his life would be different because the grace Jesus showed him. And that's what it's about, that, that change, that change. Paul comes right out and says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, he says. A lot of deceived people today. A lot of people thinking, well, Jesus died for me, so I'm good. I've been justified. I've been set apart. I'm all set. I said a prayer. I did a thing. I, I joined a church. Doesn't even matter how I live today. Paul says, do not be deceived. Self-deception's the worst. It's the worst. We truly believe a lie that how we live doesn't matter. That because we joined this church or that church, we're set forever. Because we went through, through this ceremony or this ritual as a child, we're set forever. Do not be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. You don't need a degree in Greek to understand that. Paul is very clear. Then he goes on, he gives us a, a, a partial list for neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or homosexuals, or sodomites, thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But I love verse 11, because verse 11 illustrates that sanctification process in our life. Paul says, and such were some of you. Were. were not, not such are. No, 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 no. Because you, you found Jesus, such were, that was your life, but it's not anymore. And what's Paul talking about? That process. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That, that process of becoming like Jesus, we are not who we used to be, that's another phase of sanctification. At the cross, we're immediately set apart. Phase two, we start to live it. Phase three, final sanctification. Some call it glorification because it's heaven. We're all in different places on that phase two. Some are just starting the game. Some have been in it for years some have been in it for years, but live like they're just starting the game. That's another sermon. <laughs> We're all in different places, but when we get to heaven, wherever we are, God catches us up to where we're supposed to be. That's the final tense of sanctification. But for this morning, talking about at the cross, it means that Jesus set us apart to be his children, set us apart from this world to be his, immediately transitioned from sinner to saint. What a great deal that is for us. Amen? God does that for us. That is sanctification. Third one, the word that you're probably most familiar with of all of these is redemption. 
Redemption is forgiveness, the act of saving or being saved from something, saved from sin or error or evil. Another definition, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payments, the clearing of a debt, this idea of a ransom. 1 Peter 1.18 talks about this redemption, this forgiveness, this ransom that's paid for us. And he says this, knowing that you were not redeemed, saved, ransomed, with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers. He says a lot in verse 18. What redeems us, he says, it's not these things. It's not these temporary corruptible things. It's something incorruptible. What are these corruptible things that don't redeem us? Silver and gold. There was this belief all throughout history that if you had a lot, it must be because of God's blessing. So if you have a lot of silver and gold, you must be good in God's eyes because, well, clearly you're blessed. They forgot that Satan's the God of this world, and he would love to distract you from God with some silver and gold. That is not a spiritual testimony that you have a lot. Paul says that's not what redeems us. He goes on, and he says, or your aimless conduct. And we know what that one is. (laughs) We, We don't need that one defined. Uh, our, the error of our ways, that, that is not what redeems us. That is not what saves our souls. He also talks about the tradition received from your ancestors. How many of you know you, you can't leave salvation to someone in your will? You can't pass it on like an inheritance There's people who are following traditions of people who have gone before them, but traditions don't save us. Only Jesus does. Here in 1 Peter, Peter lays out for us, it's not about money. It's not about your aimless conduct. It's not even about the traditions you've been handed down. Those are all corruptible things. What redeems us, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We talked last week about all those Old Testament sacrifices, how they, how they covered our sin for a season. But it's not talking about covering our sin. It's talking about the precious blood of Jesus, which wipes our sin away. And it's not some sacrifice where in the Old Testament, every day, every week, every year, they had to offer these different sacrifices. This was one time, for all time. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus comes, God's perfect sacrifice for you and I. And in that moment, we are redeemed. In that moment, we're ransomed. We're ransomed. A ransom demands a payment. Sin demands a payment. The Bible tells us what that payment is. It says the wages of sin is death. Sin has held us captive. Romans 7 says we're slaves to sin without Christ. Paul says it like this. He says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad stuff I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Can anyone else say amen to that? I don't think just the apostle Paul, the holiest man in the Bible outside of Jesus was struggling there. Could be you too. I don't know. Could be me. Probably not just him. And Paul wraps that up by saying, who can rescue me from this this body of sin? Thanks be to God for his son, Jesus Christ. Paul answers his own question. Thanks be to God. Jesus, as our ransom, as our ransom, sin held us captive, but Jesus not only paid the price, Jesus was the price. He stood in took our place on that cross. He paid our ransom. In Mark 10, 45, it says this, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. Jesus came, took our place, paid our price, became the payment himself, 
and ransomed us from the hold that sin and death and the enemy had in our life. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ because of what he did for us at the cross, you are immediately redeemed. Your ransom paid in full at the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank God for his redemption. Thank God that he was our ransom. Final word, fourth word, last word. The fourth one I'll share with you today is regeneration. That's when you don't like the current generation, you want to do it over. <laughs> Reg <laughs> At Generation X did nothing for me. Let's have a re no, no. Regeneration. Couple different words here. Couple different phrases that we're familiar with. Rebirth. Born again. Made new or a new creation. All of that is pointing to this idea of regeneration. Something that was dead, alive again. Something that was old, made new. Regeneration, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, talks about this. It says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This ties in really well with what we talked about last Wednesday night. Last Wednesday night, we were talking about God's design. How many of you know that God's design for mankind was perfection? Adam and Eve, for an undisclosed amount of time, are the only human beings who knew what it was like to live in this world the way God intended it to be. Perfect garden, perfect bodies, perfect relationship with each other, perfect relationship with God. There was no stress, there was no anxiety, there was no sickness, there was no toilsome labor. It was the perfect scenario exactly the way God intended it to be. Sin came in and it ruined all of it. <laughs> all of it. We all live in a world that's been ruined by sin, but what started in Genesis is recreated at the end in Revelation. And God's design started with perfection and it ends with perfection I'm just stuck in the middle with you. <laughs> we are between the two ends right now. It was perfect. It's going to be perfect. But we're not there yet. So the Bible talks about a new creation. The Bible talks about it not just in terms of eternity, but also our lives. That you are a new creation. The old one, the one all messed up by sin and everything else, God is making new. And this is what he wants to do in our lives. God wants to make you a new creation. At the cross, your status changes immediately. And then we continue on that journey. And God is making all things new. God is bringing us to a place where he desires us to be. The great news here is we're not stuck. God is still working on us. God is still doing stuff. God is making us new and ultimately will be made new completely. And the whole system, heavens and earth, all made new. This is the idea of regeneration. I'll ask the worship team to come up. I want to share a story about this regeneration, about this rebirth. And we find it in John chapter 3, maybe the most famous salvation testimony in Scripture. In John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, some of you know it, some of you don't, there's a, an interaction between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Let's read a little bit here. For there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night 
and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Tells us that he was a Pharisee, so he was in the religious leader class. It also says he was a ruler of the Jews. In the New Testament, we hear about Pharisees quite a bit. Only a a handful, less than five, are mentioned by name. Nicodemus is mentioned by name. He's also classified as a ruler. He's a ruler. I'll wait for the amber alert that undoubtedly just came in. (laughs) So we have religious leader, we have ruler of the Jews, by name Nicodemus. And he comes to Christ and he says this. He says, we know that you're from God. Clearly, you're, you're from God. No one can do all of these things that you're doing unless they're from God. And if you're not paying attention, you think in this moment he's confessing faith in Jesus. He is not. He's not. He is stating the obvious. He watched this man open the eyes of blind people. He watched him open the ears of deaf people. He even heard the story how a man was in the tomb and after three, four days, Jesus shows up and he raises Lazarus from the dead. It doesn't take a religious leader of the Jews to figure out there's something special about this Jesus guy. What Nicodemus does in this moment is he makes an intellectual recognition that there's something special about Jesus. That is not salvation. In fact, that's pretty obvious and to miss that is a you problem. There is something very special about Jesus. Knowing that there's a Jesus, knowing that there's a God and that God exists is not salvation. In fact, James tells us that even the demons know there's a God and they tremble at the fact. Knowledge that God exists is not salvation. So after Nicodemus makes his brilliant observation, Jesus responds by answering a question Nicodemus never asked. It says, Jesus answered and said, Nicodemus didn't ask anything. What what is Jesus answering? The question Nicodemus needs to know the answer to, the important one. Not the obvious one, not that there is a God, creation shows us that. Not that Jesus is an amazing person, his life shows us that. More than that, Jesus answered this question. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you are born again, new creation, regeneration, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus's response tells us he didn't understand this going in. Nicodemus responds to him, how can you be born again when you're old? Can we enter a second time into the womb and be born? Nicodemus is responding with a little bit of ridicule. Jesus, I can't be born twice. I can't climb back into my mother's womb. Jesus responds, no. (laughs) You're correct, Nicodemus. That's not what I'm talking about. What does Jesus say? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Being born of water was a reference to physical birth, to natural birth. We were all born in water. We were all born one time. We all came into this world. That's the first birth. birth. Jesus says we need to be born again. We need to be born a second time. Not our flesh, we've been born. Our spirit needs to be born. Our spirit needs to be born 
again. Not your body, your spirit. Jesus says you can be born in an earthly way, but if you're not spiritually reborn, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus, what needs to change in you isn't intellectual. It isn't confessing that I exist. You have to have a change in your heart, in your spirit, and you have to put your faith in the only one who can save you. Jesus goes on and he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And I could just imagine Nicodemus there with his his jaw dropped. And Jesus says, do not marvel. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. That was it. That was the only way. At the cross, Jesus made the way for us so that we could be born again. Now, I gotta warn you, there's some liars out there. There are some people telling you that there's other ways that you can get to heaven. There are some people who will tell you that the only way to get through heaven is through their church, their belief system. The only way to get to heaven is is their special revelation of God, their special knowledge, like they got some insiders club going on or something. Believer, don't believe them. There are those others who tell you all these things you have to do to be saved. All these hoops that you have to jump through. Some well-meaning, well-intended, But I tell you again, church, don't believe them. There are those who tell you, you don't have to do anything. You're a pretty good person. I saw a Disney movie. It said, all dogs go to heaven. You're good. You are basing your eternity on a Disney cartoon. There are those who tell you, oh, hell is for, you know, ax murderers and people like that. We're fine. We're good people. I tell you again, don't believe them because Jesus said he's the only way. You don't get in because you were baptized or sprinkled or dipped or dunked. You don't get in because your mom's in. (laughs) You don't get grandfathered in. You don't get in because you're Catholic. You don't get in because you're Protestant. You don't get in because you got the Pentecostal church card or the Baptist church card or the Methodist church card. The only way you get in is if you are born again. What does that mean? That means it's not an institutional decision. It's a personal one. It's not a decision someone else can make for you. It's your decision. Doesn't matter what your parents believe. What do you believe? Doesn't matter what your grandma was like. I mean, that's great. I hope she was wonderful. It matters what your faith is like. It doesn't matter what your church teaches. I mean, obviously it does, but it doesn't get you into heaven. It's your personal decision. And if you don't make the choice, if you don't choose to be born again, it doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen because, well, I hung out with born again people. So, you know, like COVID, I caught it from them. No, it's a personal choice and you and I and our kids and and our loved ones and those who live around us, they have to make a decision because Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one, no one, no one comes to the Father any other way except through me. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. No other way, no other path, no other method, no other tricks. You must be born again. You make a decision. One day, we will all stand before his throne. And in that moment, the thing that matters most is this decision. This decision that you made or didn't make to follow Jesus. 
to put your faith in the only way to heaven. No other way. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to join Bethel. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to give. Sir. No. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. Not mental assent. Yes, there's a God. That's not it. Not going through religious motions. That's not it. It's making a decision. Say, Jesus, I believe you went to the cross in my place. And on the third day, you rose again. And if I put my faith in you, you promise to save me. Like, like a criminal on the cross. So Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my heart. That's the message. That's the most important message you're ever going to hear. When you stand before God one day, if you, if you hadn't made that decision, he's going to tell you on March 10th, 2024, you heard it. And we're accountable for what we hear. You heard it. The offer is extended. You must be born again. Would you bow your heads with me? If that is you this morning, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. God is not angry with you. He's not mad. He's not scowling at you. He's not punishing you for the evil in your life. Jesus at the cross bore our punishments. What he's doing is he's opening his arms to you. Wait a minute, Pastor. You're telling me that people who don't go to church can be saved? Yep. Wait, you're telling me I don't have to join this church? Yep. You're telling me I just have to really put my faith. We're not talking about, you know, just like a repeat after the me, but really put my faith in Christ, and that's all I need to do. Yep. And if you're beginning to think right now, it sounds too good to be true. You've just grasped what amazing grace is because it is too good to be true, and we don't deserve it, and we only have access to it because of the cross. Yes, it's, yes, it's that easy. That's it. Why? Because Jesus did all the work for us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your sacrifice. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Make me that new creation. That's it. That's the prayer. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. You must be born again. If you're here this morning and you are not sure, I mean, you are not certain, like beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know that you know that you know that you belong to Jesus. If you don't, you need to say that prayer. You need to say it with a heart that believes. You need to jump on board and get on team Jesus and, and, and be made new and let's start that process but he's done all the work for you. Your job is to put your faith in him. I'll ask our altar team if they would come and take their spots. We'll close like we always do. The team's here. We're going to sing our final song. These altars are open for prayer. If you need prayer, if you, if you have a sickness and you need prayer, if you're going through a hard time, maybe your marriage is going through something difficult, maybe you need God's direction or your family, whatever. We, we pray for every reason. So if that's you this morning and you need prayer, I want to invite you to come and, and receive prayer. But if you're here today and you're not sure, you're not positive that you're born again. If you're not positive you're born again, you're not. Make sure today. Be certain this morning that you belong to Jesus because he loves you and it's the most important message that can ever come off this pulpit and out of these lips is that we must be born again. Stand together with me. Let's pray as we close. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you for amazing grace. Thank you for a cross where you suffered and bled and died, where you paid my price, my ransom, where you set us apart, where you redeemed us. Lord God, and you're making us new. Father, I pray in this place this morning because we know at the cross you provided all kinds of things for us. 
and, and strength and answers and provision and healing. God, it's all, it's all in, the, in the mix. But Father, most of all, you provided for our salvation, for our rebirth, that we can be born again, a new creature in Christ. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, my friends in this place this morning, those watching online who do not know if they're born again, who have not made a decision, and by doing so, have made a decision. God, that today would be the day that they put their faith, not in a church, not in a person, not in a system of rules, but they would put their faith in the only one who has the power to save, Jesus Christ. Lord, that today you would bring lost souls just like us. Bring them home, God. Bring them to you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for what you've done for us. Praise you, Lord. If that's you this morning, friend, that's what church is. That's what this is all about. If that's you this morning, I, I implore you, come to this altar, pray with one of these people here, and make the decision to put your faith in Jesus.